In Genesis chapter uh, 11, if you'll stand with me for the reading of the word, I'm going to read a few verses here from Genesis chapter 11, 1 through 7. It's now the whole earth had one language, one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they had found a plain on the land of Simar, and they dwelt there. And then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They have brick for stone. They had asphalt for mortar. They said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one. They all have, the, have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be held from them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Here in verse 6 it says, The Lord recognized that because of the power of one, the power of unity, there is nothing that's going to be kept back from them. There is nothing that they ever think or propose or purpose to do will be restrained from them. Let's pray this morning. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Lord, for your spirit, oh God, to grip our hearts, Lord, today. Lord, bring every thought and every word into captivity, oh Lord. Oh Lord, that your word be planted into our heart, oh God, as a seed. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we give you praise in your awesome and mighty name, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Uh, the power of one. The force of unity uh, is great when you get great minds to come together. And then when you get others that maybe not so great minded, but they're able to work, they bind together. Uh, even when it comes into, uh, you think about the weak, the feeble, and you get them on board, there is nothing that uh, our hands, if we put them to good use, regardless of how much strength or how little strength one may have, of uh, what can be accomplished. People who say, well, there's not much I can do. Yeah, it's amazing the power of one yes. and what you can do. Yes. Uh, I'm reminded what uh, Paul said that we can do all things through Christ who will give us strength yes. or who will strengthen right. us. Uh, the U.S. Army captured the concept of the power of one. They said we are an army of one. Now it doesn't mean just one individual. They, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of individuals today that serve in the U.S. Army. And it's not about a hundred thousand being a hundred thousand little tiny individuals out there doing their own thing, but it's a hundred thousand of them acting as one, one mind, one goal, and one uh, motivation, one drive, and to do, do one accomplishment. It's about fighting together and not against. It's about pulling together. Right. And it's not about pulling apart. Yeah. When you see and look into this verse, 
6, it says, Nothing that they propose to do will be held from them. We know that whether it's good or evil forces in the world, but when evil joins together to purpose or to propose to do something, it brings destruction. And yet when people have good wills and good motives and motives and they come together for a purpose, there's a lot that can be accomplished. When disaster strikes, what takes place? What, what group is on the scene during the time of disaster? They have trucks that have a slogan on the back of it. They're known as first responders. But I'm not talking about the uh, uh, firemen. I'm not talking about the police. I'm not talking about uh, those who will go and rescue EMTs. I'm talking about the American Red Cross. They're, they're known as a first responder. In time of disaster, we will be there. You talk about a team, it's not about one person. Right. And I know that, it's in, that you have other first responders during time of disaster. We saw it during 9-1-1. Uh, the, the firemen that was there to, that were willing to give their life to go into the, uh, those buildings to try to rescue at least one more soul. Let's see if I can get one more soul out of that building. There's got to be one more person that I can help. And some of those first responders lost their life. And then, but the American Red Cross, during time, whether it's a house burning, or a, an earthquake, or tornadoes, or hurricanes, or whatever, you know, they were there to set their tents to provide water and shelter. They provide uh, uh, blankets, you know, to try to get people, you know, to shelter somewhere. You talk about uh, a people. Uh, that will draw people together. And you, you see during our time of national disaster how people begin to pull together. You know, uh, I remember working with individuals during uh, the uh, Hurricane Katrina. Some of the men that I worked with uh, took time off and went down to Louisiana to, to give of themselves to help during that time. They didn't know people down there, but they were willing to give of themselves. Uh -huh. And yet we see that uh, there were two men that were willing to give of themselves for good. When uh, Moses was instructed by God, when they were meeting the Mennonites and the Amalekites in the valley below, uh, God told Moses to go up and raise your hands. One man alone, standing on the hillside with his hands stretched upward, below the valley, the Israelites were winning a war. But how many of you this morning can hold your hands high for a long period of time? Because we know that when you go to war, it's not just a matter of 10 minutes. It's not a matter of 30 minutes. We may be talking about days. We've been in Afghanistan for years. Think about how to set on your stand and hold your hand up because God said, I'm going to give you the victory. Just keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. But I'll tell you what, after a while, Standing there, and, you, and Moses was the Lone Ranger at that time. He was the only one up on the hill, and his arms began to get tired. They began to start sagging, and when they got, when they started dropping, the enemy began to get the advantage. When Moses saw that. The enemy was getting the advantage, the upper hand. He had to take all the strength that he could muster within him and thrust his hands back up. And the Israelites began to win again. All of a sudden, this uh, 
uh, aggression, regression, aggression, regression, was taking effect that two other individuals noticed. Here, Moses up there, we're over here, the fighting's down there, and yet, every time his hand starts dropping, we're, we're starting losing. Our men are starting to retreat. There's something wrong with this picture. So two men said, we're going to bind ourselves to that man. Aaron and Ur went up there. They said, here, Moses, back up. We're going to plant you on this rock. You're going to have a seat. It may not be the most comfortable place, but we're going to make it comfortable for you. We're going to have you set. Nothing was said about whether he had to lay down with his hands up, stand up, or he says, just keep your hands up. So you sit here, and Aaron and Ur on each side of the man of God took his arms, and we're going to be there and hold your arms up. And they won the victory. God gave them the victory because of the faithfulness of not just yeah. Moses keeping his hands raised, but the power of one. No, there was three up there. But the power of one. They acted as one. One force. So God can give a victory. Right. And this morning the church, we are a power force of one when we are working together, when we are laboring together. Right. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Whether we're 10 or we're 10,000, we are one. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We may not be very strong in our own might and our own power this morning, but I tell you what, when you get two or three or four together, what powerful force there is. That they even recognize the power of one when it comes to losing weight. That's why they have Weight Watchers. Why is it? Because you are held accountable. Weekly meetings. Weekly weigh-ins, uh, weekly get-togethers where you have to say, what did you eat or what, what did you not eat? What are you doing or what you're not doing? And then, then there's the words of encouragement. Maybe you didn't lose any weight this week, but the, the support that you're there as one. It, it brings power and unity. And yet we see in the, uh, the first church how they were with one mind and one accord. They worked together. And it wasn't just about on the day of Pentecost. In the upper room. And where they experienced God's presence coming down. But that spirit of unity was followed through day after day after day after day. Oh, hallelujah. The same force is with us this morning. No, not some outer space force. I'm talking about the force of God's spirit within the church today is with us and dwelling in us. Oh, hallelujah. And yet, if we will propose to put our hands to use to do whatever we can do with all of our might, with all of our strength. I, I read a, a just a, kind of a one-liner last night too. Matthew, he stopped by the office and I said, this little pop-up ad on my uh, screen said, uh, it shows this gentleman and it says underneath it says, he only weighs 170 pounds but he bench presses 430 something pounds, 35 pounds. I don't know, uh, maybe Brother Precious, Brother uh, uh, Justin weighs in about 170 pounds. You don't have to you know, share your weight, but just kind of guessing and just imagine them uh, trying to pr bench press someone like Matthew and I. <laughs> and neither one of us are over 400 pounds and I will tell you how much I weigh if he wants to wear, tell you how much he weighs but just imagine y'all say okay we're going to pick you up and go a cradle rock and you know, I'll probably be doing everything 
poor brother Justin can to uh, say, <laughs> pick up a leg. <laughs> What's that, leg in concrete or what? Yeah. You know, when you, but you think about an ant, how small they are, and they can carry, you know, 20, 30 times their weight. They're by themselves. And yet, if they get a piece of meat or a piece of bread or something that's too big for them, they're, they're tugging at it, and they're tugging at it, and they're tugging at it. And if they're not able to get it moved, that little ant disappears. And guess what? He goes, gets, he gets hit his buddies. And I've seen these little teeny tiny ants. There's a whole bunch of them. And they're trying to pull on. Guess what? When that doesn't work, they just crawl over that meat and they say, okay, we can't take it home. So we're going to just sit here and have a feast. And they don't just get five or six of their buddies. They go get the whole clan. And you'll see the whole clan around that piece of meat. It was too heavy for them to eat, so guess what? They became an army of one. They became a power of one. It's why we can't get it to us, but we'll get them to it. You know, and that's where the church has to be. Sometimes we're not able to get the word into people because they won't come into the house to get the word. So let's take the word to them. What about the shut-ins this morning? What, what about those who are unable to get out? There's nothing wrong with taking the Word of God and having a Bible study in their home. Lord. You know, people say, well, I, I'd love to study the Word of God, but come on out to church. Well, oh, yeah, I'll be there. And guess what? Six years later, they're not here. But if they're really hungry and they want to know the Word of God, and they want to build a relationship with people. Maybe that's what's causing them or the hindrance because they really don't know anybody. How many of you are willing to go into a place where there's a whole crowd of people and you don't know anybody? Even though somebody said, invited you to come out, show up. There are, that's only one person you know and, and you know that you're going to hang with them all night because they're going to hang with their friends and, and I don't know their friends, and especially if you're a timid and a shy type of person. So you'd rather not go, so you're not embarrassing yourself by looking like a sore thumb. And that's why sometimes people are about coming to church. Unless God has really gripped their heart and brought them under a total conviction and the power, or if they're really out seeking something. You know, that there are people that will fast and pray and say, God, I want you to show me the church. I want to show, I want the people. I want where your word is preached. I want truth. And God sends an individual past their way and, and said, our preacher, our church believes in truth. Our church believes in holiness. That's the church I want to go to. And they show up and they're in the church for years. But other people aren't like that. They make a relationship, they build a relationship, and they build a circle of friends. That you're talking about a power of what? Oh, if we're going to win our neighbors, if we're going to win our community, if we're going to win the world, we're going to win it one soul at a time. That's right. Amen. We see that there was 120, uh, approximately 120 on the day of Pentecost in the upper room. All of those were associated. They had some kind of connection. You know, it's great to have a family that big and you're all, you know, you're already friends. But it's another thing when you leave that place and you meet the people on the street. Now you're taking the word to the street. Guess what? There's a whole lot of people on the street when they was coming down the stairs that they didn't know. It's like, oh, wow, you must have had a great time up there. And all of a sudden, there was a few in the crowd that recognized that these were just nothing but stupid Galileans. Unlearned Galileans. Uh -huh. Now, what, what are we going to learn from them? But they were intimidated by what these people on the street had to say. It's like, you just witnessed something that happened up there that you weren't a part of. Now I'm going to tell you. You think we're drunk? It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. You mean, 
you, you don't break out the, the wine until the afternoon. And, you know, when we weren't drinking, having a drinking party all night either. We, we were waiting for something supernatural to happen. And Peter began to preach to them a message. But guess what? Their, some of their hearts were already touched. Yes, there was a few skeptics down there. There was a few that, you know, said, oh, these unlearned uh, Galileans. But some of them began to have inquiring minds. What took place? What just happened? And Peter began to tell them about this Jesus whom they crucified, whom they cried out to let his blood be upon their hands, upon their children and their children's children. And guess what? By the time Peter got done uh, giving his little sermon, his message, someone began to cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Because the word says they were pricked in their heart. It, it wasn't like taking a, an ice pick and just making a poke. But being pricked in their heart, it was taking the sword and cutting them through and through. That they should have said, or should have been written, that Peter's word cut them like a dagger. Their blood now was being and guts are spilled all over. That's what it means. The prick. It was like their innards were just being dumped out. What shall we do? And I'm thankful that Peter did not say. Just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're going to be saved. But Peter said, you ask, I'm going to tell you. Right. You want truth, I'm going to tell you. If you want to know what really took place, it's all because of this. You're going to, you need to repent of your sin. Jesus said, repent. Uh, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of right. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You know, we, we have people that say, oh, it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah, it doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter how, what you believe. We're all going the same road. Well, yeah, the majority of the Christian religions are going the same road. Uh -huh. It's going down to destruction. Jesus said there's only one way, that he was a way. And Peter said, I'm not going to compromise, but you ask, I'm going to tell you. Repent of your sins. Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of the yes. sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Right. Right. For this promise is unto you and to your children, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You're talking about future generations. My, my three grandbabies. My three little angels. You know, one of these days, they're going to grow up. And I want them to know truth. Right. Right. I want them to, you know why? Because of the power of what? Yes. Grandma and Grandpa that put truth into Papa and married a, a young lady that loved truth, Mimi, who had children who imparted truth to them, whether they're walking in whole truth or partial truth or that the word of God's been in their hearts and they, right. they know what is truth. And now they have their babies and, 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 and Papa and Mimi, it, you know, pray for these children. And, and it's not that we pray for them privately. Because Lady Clara, she knows what it is at three years old to pray. 12, 1 o'clock at night, she'll crawl on Papa's bed and say, Papa, pray for me. Papa, pray for me. I want you to pray for me. And I'll pray for her. And, uh, and she said, well, you didn't pray for you. Pray for Papa. I said, you pray for Papa. And sometimes she'll start, she said, and she'll pray. This is not me. This is her. But I know where she got it. 
because she feels the power and of prayer. And she'll go, Oh God, touch my Paul Paul. God, give him a good night's rest. But God, <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> One night, she and I had a prayer meeting. Uh, it must last an hour. And uh, Mimi said the next morning, Boy, you and Clara was really having some prayer time in your last night. And said, yes. I mean, it wasn't just... I mean, she's sincere, three years old. And, but God, that's the power of one. Yeah. And we got to teach our children. You know, I was, a group years ago recorded a, a song. Parents, teach your children well. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I remember off the song. It's a phrase that lingers in my mind and burdens me. Yes, church, teach your children well. You guess what? There's the power of one. The power of one. And yet, I know this morning that we serve one God. Right. In that one God, there is power. Right. Amen. Amen. In that one God, there's authority. And we have the access to that power yes. and that authority this morning. Hallelujah. Just during during the time of Babel, the building of the temple, of the, the tower, building of that evil city, and all those evil men with evil thoughts doing evil in their hearts. And God saw what a powerful source of one can do. And yet, within the church this morning, you think of there is nothing that's going to limit us and our ability when we become that power of one through Jesus Christ. Letting his power, his anointing to flow through us. Yes, that's right. Thank you, Jesus. We can shake before. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can shake your community, whether it's Yorkville, Bartlettville, Chicago, Peoria, Elmwood, Washington, East Peoria. You're talking about the power of what? Because we are one with Him. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. And He longs for people to have that unity, that drive to be one with Him. Yes. In His prayer in John chapter 17, He says that they may be one. Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And that's our prayer today, that we stay as one that we will rise with one voice we will rise with one authority we will rise and speak with one word That's right. Thank you, Jesus. and then it becomes his word right. thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God yes. <laughs> hallelujah let's all stand this morning